Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here and you enjoy what you are hearing, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button and make sure to set the bell to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video, which tends to be daily. If you'd like to learn how to become a member or tip me with a cup of coffee, that information can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin, entitled true let's not meet stories right after this intro there will be an ad right after the first story there will be an ad and after that there will be no more ads within this video disclaimer this video is for educational and entertainment purposes i've flown with my one-year-old solo nearly a dozen times Usually, people are understanding and kind about me having a baby on my lap. And overall, he's a happy, easy baby. He's also very cute, so it's not uncommon for strangers to talk to him. Usually, I don't mind. The last trip I took, I sat alone in my aisle, with a man sitting by himself directly behind me. My baby was tired and fussing. I knew he was tired, there's not a lot I could do, until we took off. Right out of the gate, the man behind me was talking to my baby, saying, Oh, hi, baby. Why so sad, baby? Cute, cute, baby. I smiled and replied that he was tired, sorry for the fuss, and thank you. After takeoff, I started to get him settled for a nap. The man behind us continued to talk to my baby, putting his hand through the seat to try and grab his feet. Multiple times, I asked him nicely to please stop. My baby was tired. You're distracting him. He just needs a nap. Finally, I set my baby down next to me. He stood on the floor facing the seat next to me so that I could make a bottle. The man behind me stood up and reached over my seat to pick him up. I immediately leaned forward to pick up my baby, saying, no, thank you. I don't need help. Please, no. No, thank you. The man pushed me back into my seat while mumbling, Sweet baby, why baby cry? I replied very loudly, No, and quickly picked up my baby. I thought that this was the end of that, but boy was I wrong. I tried to rock my baby to sleep while desperately trying not to lose control. As I'm rocking my baby, the man behind me reaches through our seat to grab my arm, saying, No rocking. No rocking. You'll make him cry. I pulled free from him and yelled, Do not touch me. Again, I thought that'd be the end. I started rocking my baby for the second time. This man, the man behind me, reached both hands around each side of my seat to hold me in place, saying, No, no rocking. Stop the rocking. I am somewhat embarrassed that I completely lost it, clutching my baby to my chest while struggling to get free of him. And yes, it hurt. I hit the call light while screaming, Let me go. Do not touch me. Let me go, let me go, let me go. He was still holding me by my arms when the flight attendant came running. I could barely get anything out of the flight attendant. Everyone around us was staring. I was sobbing, and all I could get out was that I could not sit there anymore, and for the love of God, please move me. The man behind me tried to move with me, but I told the flight attendants that I did not know him, and he could not come with me. I had a good cry in my new seat, but my baby immediately went to sleep. I was moved to be next to the flight attendant's seat. After calming down, I explained to the flight attendants what had happened. Multiple times, the man that had been behind me got up to try to come back to my new seat only to be turned around by one of the flight attendants. 
Towards the end of the flight, one of the flight attendants told me that they'd explain everything to the pilot, and the pilot had called the FBI and local police to escort the man off the flight. I would also be escorted off as well as everyone around us that had watched everything happen. He cheered as he was escorted off. I had to interview with the FBI and nearly missed my next flight. After my trip was done, I had to fly back going through the same airport. It was stressful and emotional to say the least, even knowing that he was banned from the airline and the airport. I haven't flown since. To the man that tried to grab my baby from me and then wouldn't let go of me, let's never fucking meet again. This was about 15 years ago. I was 19 and studying abroad in a country in Southeast Asia. The study abroad program was very small. I think it was like six or seven students and loosely structured and we had a ton of freedom. I had been traveling the summer before the program started and arrived a week earlier than the other students. They had us staying in a small house near the program center in a busy neighborhood. The house was also rented to locals during the summer, but typically only to students from this program during the school year. Again, I had moved into the house early and it was completely empty aside from myself. The owners of the house were pretty traditional and strict and it was made clear that we were not allowed to have any visitors, especially men. At one point, my first day there, I heard a knocking at the door. I looked out from an upstairs window, and it was a bald local man that didn't look like anyone from my school program. They knocked for about 10 minutes before I decided to pretend I wasn't there, and he eventually left. The day this happened was also during Ramadan. There's typically a curfew in the city, but because of Ramadan, many people were out late eating. I met up with a local couch surfing group and ended up hitting it off with a cute German tourist. Eventually, we made plans for him to sneak into my house with me, which we thought would be easy because it was so late. When we arrived, I saw a couple of cars outside of the house, so I had him wait at the far end of the block so I could make sure the coast was clear. What I walked up to was extremely confusing. There was a big white jeep in front of the house and men with large guns were standing around it. There was also a small gray sedan with the doors open and a man sitting in the driver's seat. He looked like the man that had been knocking at the door earlier. The housekeeper, a sweet middle-aged man, was also outside with the men and seemed very upset. I can't remember exactly what was said, but I remember the man in the car repeatedly saying my full name, which I do not go by, changing it here for privacy. He said something like, come on, Cassandra, everything is okay. Just get in the car. I only go by Cassie and never introduce myself as Cassandra. I have no idea who this person was, but he did feel extremely friendly and weirdly charming, like he was there to help me, but I knew he wasn't. The men with the guns then started asking me if I knew him. I said no repeatedly, but I got the weird feeling that they all wanted me to say yes, like it would be solving some sort of problem for them. They were not pointing the guns at me, but it was still extremely frightening, especially because I felt like I had nowhere to go, and also that I was already hiding my German visitor. The man in the sedan got out and approached me and tried to kind of herd me into the car. At this point, the men with the guns had grabbed the housekeeper and were being really rough with him. Some neighbors were watching nearby now, and I was confused why no one was helping. Finally, a neighbor approached and yelled something in the local language to the group. He told me, then in English, to get inside immediately. 
Everyone left, and the men with the guns took the housekeeper with them. I got inside and locked the door. At this point, I started crying, but still felt a little bit in shock. Everything felt quiet very suddenly in comparison to all the commotion. A few minutes later, I heard a light knock at the door and someone calling Cassie. I realized it was the German tourist. I ended up leaving with him and going back to his hotel instead. He turned out to be a great guy and really helped me calm down. When I got back to the house the next day, everything seemed to be mostly normal. The housekeeper was there, and though we didn't speak the same language, he seemed very despondent. What I learned later was that the white jeep was an unmarked police car and the men with guns were local police. The man in the sedan had been trying to get into the house and someone called the police. I still have no idea what the man in the sedan wanted or how he knew my full name, but somehow the housekeeper ended up getting blamed for the confusion and was apparently beaten at the police station before the same neighbor that helped me got a group from the neighborhood together to go get him. By far, the most troubling part was when I called my advisor from the school that day to let her know what happened. She was a really nice person, but as soon as we got on the phone, she had a really strict tone with me and said something along the lines of, Cassie, we already told you that you may absolutely not have male visitors, even if you ask permission. It's not okay. I was confused, but apparently a female had called and left a message on her phone yesterday, saying that a man would be coming to the house later, and the housekeeper should let him in. The female had called herself Cassandra. That part still gives me a stomachache when I think about it. My advisor believed me when I told her it wasn't me, but there didn't seem to be much recourse aside from asking the neighborhood to look out for the man in the sedan and not to let him inside the house. I'm still not sure how this happened or what would have happened had the men gotten into the house or had I gotten into his car. My best guess is that a student that used to live in that house saw from our school's private Facebook group that I would be arriving early and for some reason gave that information to the man and called my advisor posing as me. Facebook is one of the few places where I have an account under Cassandra instead of Cassie, and I don't know how else they would know how to contact my advisor. Either way, I still have no idea what they would have done with me, and I'm eternally grateful to have not been alone with that man. Okay, I want to preface this by saying that my writing is not all that great, but I needed to tell my story. So, here it goes. This happened in 2013, when I was around 12. My mom moved me and my siblings in with my grandparents because we did not have enough money for rent at the time, and she needed to save it. It wasn't a big deal, though. They had plenty of room, and I got to spend a lot of time jewelry making with my grandma, which, in my little eyes, was such a win that I didn't even realize we were that poor. It was our little pastime after school, and one of my favorite parts were the trips we would take to Michael's to get beads and materials occasionally. Michael's, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is a craft store similar to Hobby Lobby, and... Walking around in it is a little girl's dream when it comes to DIY stuff. One day, in the late fall, we realized we had run out of wire for a bracelet I was making for my mom. So we headed out to our local Michaels to get more. This particular day was in winter, so it already had begun to get dark by 5 p.m. My grandma, having vision problems and a bad hip, entrusted little me to run in and grab the wire and pay for it 
as we had done so many times together before. I was stubbornly independent, so she wasn't very worried about me. She parked right in the handicap spot in front of the store. The sun setting and the light from the big storefront windows illuminated her car behind me as I walked inside. As I was standing by the display at the front entrance, some Christmas Day or something, a man walked by through the sliding doors. I noticed him immediately. It was hard not to. He was tall. I think I may have just been short. I don't know. Maybe in his mid-thirties with dark hair and wearing all black from head to toe. His clothes were a bit dirty, and I distinctly remember a big red D1 logo on his hoodie. He had his hands shoved into his pockets and walked briskly into the store, almost frantically. I just watched him. He made eye contact with me for a bit too long and then continued deeper into the store. I was immediately weirded out, but thought nothing else of it and went off to find the wire. I found my spool of wire, but getting distracted in the toy section was where I fucked up. That's when I noticed him starting to follow me around, aisle to aisle. I would be browsing and he would just appear at the other end and fake looking at stuff. He was muttering to himself constantly. You know when someone says something out loud expecting a response, but they aren't really directly looking at you. Yeah, it was like that. As a kid, I don't really realize what's happening immediately. So I just awkwardly walked away from him each time pretending to not notice him. In my little brain, I reasoned that he wasn't following me and walked all the way across the store to the wedding aisle to look at some stuff I had seen when I first walked in. I figured there'd be no way he would follow me there. But sure enough, while looking at the invitation cards, I get a spine-chilling feeling. I turn around, and there he is, right behind me, back to me, doing something. Messing with something in his pants, doing something really vile to himself. I had never seen anything like that, and the sunken eyes he looked at me with still haunt me to this day. It took me a minute to process what I had just seen, but once I did, I immediately booked it out of the store as fast as I could. Jumping into my grandma's car, she seemed startled by my sudden appearance and asked what I got. I tried to explain what had just happened when I saw him appear in the sliding door in front of us, and the dread I felt in that moment was indescribable. He approached our car, obviously recognizing I was with my grandma, and knocked on her window. I hadn't been able to explain myself in time because she cracked the window and asked him if everything was okay. The man gestured to me with that same crazy stare had said something along the lines of, she's a thief, she stole from there. I was mortified. He was trying to make her suspect of me, on top of everything else he had just put me through. Thankfully, my grandma got the same bad vibes I did because she politely told him to back away and rolled the window up while locking the door. He suddenly yanked on her door handle then swung both of his arms up and started banging down hard on the car's roof, causing us both to jump and me to start crying. My grandma slammed it in reverse and peeled out of there. I have never seen her drive that fast in my life. I don't remember much after that, just the crying and holding a $17 spool of wire in my hands that I hadn't paid for. We called the cops as soon as we got home, and luckily, they immediately took it very seriously and requested the videotapes from the Michaels. A few weeks later, my grandma told me that they had found him. They mostly left me out of the investigation besides taking my statement as to not traumatize me further, I guess. She got the dent in her car fixed, and that was that. 
It wasn't until a few years later that my mom finally told me what had happened to him. It turns out he already had one battery charge and two sexual assaults on his record, one being from a minor relative of his, like his niece or something. He had just gotten off work from the gas station across the street when he must have seen me walk into the Michael store alone. I don't know what would have happened if my grandma hadn't locked her door, or if she had been in there with me, vulnerable to that man as well. So, scary freak for Michaels. Let's please not ever meet again. Alrighty, everyone, the author has marked this next story as a trigger warning for some of the material within. Listening discretion is highly advised. This was a many, many years ago, maybe when I was 20 or 21. I was assaulted when out jogging in a park while on vacation someplace north in Ontario. It was deep in the woods. I was listening to music, alone. I should have been more careful. There was this guy with a blue dirt bike at the entrance to the trail who was acting really creepy and suspicious. He kept trying to start conversations with me as I was unpacking my stuff and getting ready. Kept asking about things like, where did you come from? Or, do you work out? When I was changing my shoes, he asked me for my shoe size, and I immediately thought he was a creep. I just lightly chatted with him and kept my gaze down. I was wearing a hat, so it would hopefully hide my face from him. Nearly half an hour of jogging and sightseeing, I saw the blue bike ahead. I was parked off to the side, and I remember the feeling like a lump in my stomach suddenly forming, and I thought for sure that guy was probably ahead to try something. I was on the path for the whole way since, but considering he was waiting there, I decided to backtrack a little and take the nearest side path to avoid the encounter. Five minutes into the side path, there was this narrow spot in the trees that led onto an old concrete square. I think it was like a water reservoir or fountain or something. I wasn't thinking and just kept going. I stepped into this black adhesive stuff on the other side of a lip of concrete. My shoes were completely stuck. It was like some kind of tar or glue. I have no idea. I didn't know what it was and just assumed it was something from the structure, like leftover construction stuff or something, I don't know. I spent a couple of minutes just trying to work my shoes out, but eventually had to take them off for better leverage. Then I saw the man. He came towards me. I just felt panicked. I was going to get my bear spray when he said he was just here to help. I didn't want to potentially aggravate him or do something that could get me in trouble. So, I just stood back and let him try to get my shoes out. I noticed that he was just pretending that he couldn't get them out, and I remembered what he said about my shoe size and thought something was off. So, I backed away and considered spraying him. It happened so fast. He turned around and slapped my foot with the black stuff. I stumbled trying to get back. I missed the spray, and he was wrestling it out of my hand. I tried to knee him in the groin. He released me and ran off. I got my sock off and was going to run, but he just had more of the stuff. He had some metal bucket of the black tar he was slapping handfuls of it on my feet. I couldn't kick him and it was difficult to move. I was screaming and hitting him as best as I could. I'm sorry if this is too much detail. He was telling me to shut up and 
use it on my mouth. He pushed me to the ground, took my backpack, and just continued sticking this stuff to me all over my body as I was frozen in fear. I heard a buzzing sound, and I knew what it was without seeing it. I began struggling to get up or kick him, do something. My clothes were pinned and my arms too. I'm not going to give details, but he used a woman's sexual toy on me. I was crying, stretching it as far as I could. I could get my arm almost out. And then he would add more. I rarely ever masturbated at the time, so suffice it to say, it was overstimulation. He didn't undress me apart from my pack and socks, and didn't use his manhood anywhere. So I'm at least grateful for that. He just kept buzzing me and fondling my body with the stuff, asking things like, do you like it? Or does it feel good? It was probably around an hour of that, and he was recording it. I just let him do whatever until I found a way out or someone came to help. Then he brought this towel up to my nose. It was fuming and some chemical. I was thrashing and trying to scream. Somebody heard, I guess, and shouted I don't remember much, really. Time was all fuzzy. I felt like I was falling on a roller coaster. When I got my thoughts back together, it was getting dark and I was alone. I spent a long time getting out without ripping my clothes and scratching the stuff off my body where it was on my skin. I still don't know what it was, but Googling it suggested bird lime or construction adhesive. It was also apparently a type of fetish. So, yeah. I walked back to my car. There was nobody there at night. And I just drove back to my cabin and sat there in the bath and hadn't even turned the water on. I was just sitting there thinking of what happened, trying to get as much off me before I washed off. My feet and other parts around my belly were stained black for a couple of weeks, and that night I just lay there silent. Even now, just touching stuff like soap brings back that time, and I can't help but feel weird by slimy, feeling things. I'm wondering if anybody has had a similar experience or encountered this black adhesive. This happened a few years ago in Upper Ontario on a semi-official hiking trail. I really don't remember much of what happened during or after the assault, possibly because of whatever fumes I was exposed to. I remember driving very slowly because I was still feeling off balance. In hindsight, I probably shouldn't have been driving, but, but there was no traffic that late to the creepy guy in the woods that sexually assaulted me and left me scarred for life. Let's never meet again. I used to do some street performing when I was low on money, and at the time of this story, I was 25. I had recently lost a lot of weight and needed to save money for skin removal surgery. In addition to buying all new clothing and seeing a chiropractor because of the changes in my gait affecting my spine. Pro tip, losing weight is expensive as fuck. I don't know why nobody warned you about that. So this was a Friday night and I was in a college town near the state university with a lot of bars and restaurants, because all of my clothes hang off of my body like a tablecloth. I was wearing a decorative scarf tied into a dress, and it was a little on the revealing side, but didn't look as sloppy as the rest of my clothing. If you don't wear decent clothing and makeup and such when you street perform, people assume you're homeless and can be real shitty towards you. 
This is relevant to the story. So I was tuning up my guitar, sitting in a camping chair outside of a couple of bars, and at around 8.30 p.m., this beige SUV pulls up and parks in front of me. The guy driving it hopped out and approached me. Hey, do you want something to eat? No, I'm okay, thanks though. Hmm, okay. And he got back in his car, but instead of driving away, he just sat there, staring at me. I thought it was a little bit strange at the time, but I was focused on getting warmed up, so I didn't initially worry about too much. I was only planning on staying out until about midnight, so I wanted to maximize my time. It was the end of dinner time, beginning of bar time rush, so it took me a while to realize the beige SUV was still sitting there, and the guy was still sitting in the driver's seat looking at me. I'm pretty sure he didn't even pay the parking meter. At about 9.30, he hops out again. Hey, are you hungry yet? No, really, I'm okay. I ate before I came out here. Ah, come on. I want to give you something, but I don't have any cash. Let me buy you dinner. This does happen. When someone who doesn't carry cash sees a street musician that they like, they will often offer to buy you a snack and bring it to you. So I didn't find that strange. Um, okay, sure. If you want to bring me a snack, that's fine. Okay, come with me. Uh, no, I'm not leaving my stuff here. There's a really good restaurant I wanted to take you to, but it's too far of a walk. We need to drive there. Uh, um, no, sorry, I, I'm not interested in going anywhere. I need to stay here and make some money tonight. I thought you were hungry. Come on, let me buy you dinner. Me, starting to get frustrated. No. I told you I'm not actually that hungry. If you want to tip me with something other than cash, a slice of pizza from the place across the street or a soda or a cigarette, that I'm fine with, but I'm not leaving my spot and my equipment. No, I'm not going to buy you a slice of pizza. If you want dinner, you need to come with me. At this point, tons of people were walking past us and I was really getting annoyed at him for keeping me from playing my music. Well, I'm not going anywhere, and I need to make some money tonight, so I'm done talking about this, please. At that point, I started playing my guitar to show him that I was done with this conversation. I probably should have been more concerned by this point, but I was honestly just pissed off. It wasn't that uncommon for men who saw me street performing to offer me food or shelter in exchange for sex, so I kind of assumed that's what he was after at that point. For about the next hour, I focused on just playing music and chatting with people, and it was actually a pretty productive night. I had almost forgotten about the creepy dude until he got out of his car and leaned against the door, still staring at me. At this point, it was about 11 p.m., and it dawned on me that he had been there for over two hours. That's when the alarm bells finally started to go off in my head. I had a hard time focusing on music after that, because he was just standing there, staring at me. And the longer it lasted the more I felt he had something way more nefarious than just trying to bribe a young homeless woman to sleep with him in mind. At about 11.30, I realized I needed to do something sooner rather than later. It was pretty much peak bar hour, but the streets were going to become less crowded eventually, and I was hoping to be walking home. I didn't want to risk him following me. Now, when I'm street performing, I'm in friendly mode, and I'm not the most intimidating looking girl in general, so I don't think he was expecting me to confront him directly. But when I feel threatened, I tend to get pretty mad pretty fast. Figured I had plenty of witnesses, I walked right up to him, 
angry as hell at this point. Why are you staring at me? Wait a minute, what? You've been staring at me for three hours now. Do you just like making younger women uncomfortable? I was so mad, talking progressively faster and louder, and it was very clear this wasn't going the way he expected it to. <laughs> no, 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 no. I want to buy you dinner. So you're just waiting for me to get hungry enough to go to dinner with you when I've already said no several times? That's not being helpful. It's being creepy. I know there aren't any restaurants that are still open, or at least until 1130 around here. No, no. This one is. Look, it's still open. I don't care if it's still open, because I don't want to go anywhere with you, and I told you that. So why are you still here waiting? No, you don't understand. He looked like he was racking his brain for an excuse. What? What am I not understanding about you staring at me for the last three hours? No, you see, I'm an Uber driver. Of all the stupid excuses he could have picked, this was possibly the stupidest. Me pretending to understand. Oh, okay, I get it. You've been waiting all this time for someone who ordered an Uber. Yes, yeah. Me dropping the act. And you were just going to leave them waiting while you took me to a restaurant then? What happened next freaked me out more than anything else that night. As soon as I blew a hole through his piss-poor cover story, it was like he took off a mask. His smile disappeared, and his voice was deadly serious as he climbed back into his car and said to me, Okay, you will never see my face again. And he drove off. Fast. I still stood there shook. I had plenty of creepy encounters while street performing, but not like this. It was impossible to convince myself that he was going to do anything besides abduct me. I was done after that. I decided to order an actual Uber home instead of walking, which cost about half of what I had made in tips that night. In the back of that Uber, counting my cash, I realized that it was time to retire. The small amount of money I made during the daytime was not worth the effort, and the decent money I made at night was not worth the risk. I've since moved on to a new side hustle and also developed agoraphobia, diagnosed, because of this and other incidents like it. I hate leaving the house now. I order most of my groceries and household supplies through DoorDash and I have a job that's only three blocks away from my apartment. Still, on my walks to and from work, I find myself constantly checking my surroundings, using the reflection in storefront windows to make sure I'm not being followed. So, to the creepy asshole in the beige SUV, I hope you keep your promise and that I never see your face ever again. It was summer break, and we, my family, didn't go on any trip, unlike every break. I was just eight years old, and my younger sister was three. We were playing along with the other kids who lived in the same building as us, just on different floors. The building is not exactly an apartment building, it's more of a multi-storied house. The front gate is a bit further from there, and the only entrance and exit of the building. So, since we were downstairs and playing, anybody who would enter or exit the building would be visible to us, and we'd greet them because every tenant knows us, and we know them, as well as their families who might come to visit. A new person visiting any tenant is rare, but not impossible. Right adjacent to the big entrance gate is a small old-style window with 
grill, but it is a small opening at the bottom. We were all playing, but then I got tired and sat on one of those chairs placed at the porch-like place. I'm not sure what to call it, to be honest. From there, the window thingy falls on the right side, and I can see it as well as the gate clearly. I was just looking out when I noticed a man staring at the gate, which looks very similar, so basically he was able to look at my sister and friends through it. It concerned me when I realized that he wasn't even trying to look away. He was just staring at them blankly. I turned around from where I was sitting to signal to my friends to move to the other side, away from his sight, which she didn't understand. Frustrated, I turned back and was about to stand up when my gaze fell on the guy, and he was now staring at me. My body froze, and I could feel fear creeping up on me. I couldn't move. I don't know why. I stared back at him, and suddenly he started smiling. And when I say smiling, I mean full-on grinning from ear to ear. That scared the soul out of my body, and I mustered some courage, got up, and ran towards my friend. I didn't tell them anything and just asked them to go upstairs with me, which, thankfully, they did without questioning. I didn't tell anything about this to my parents because I thought that they would stop me from going downstairs to play. The next day, we again came down to play, and I looked through the window just to make sure he wasn't there. Fortunately, he wasn't. Or so I thought. Fifteen minutes in, and I spotted that guy again. He was again standing at the very spot and staring at us. At me. I tried to play it cool because my friends knew nothing about him, but I couldn't for too long, and we went back in again. From what I remember, this happened for three to four days, and now my friends started complaining about how I didn't let them play and that they have to come back earlier than they are supposed to. On the fifth day, or fourth, I don't remember exactly, I made up my mind to not pay attention to him and just focus on playing. We were playing cricket that evening, and I was batting. I hit the ball hard, causing it to go over the gate, which was a very normal thing. And as per rules made by us, the one responsible must fetch the ball. My heart started beating because I could see his grin getting wider and creepier. He went towards the ball on the road and picked it up. He then held his hand out, gesturing me to come and take it. I was shit scared at this point, but I had to go, so I did. As soon as I reached to take the ball from his hand, he bent coming close to my ear, and his words are still ringing clearly in my ears to this day. I'm a good man. Look at the window when you go inside. I'll leave something for you. This is a rough translation to English. It sounded much worse. And for you all the listeners, I really did try the British accent, but I think it came out Australian. <laughs> I'm sorry. That sent shivers down my spine, and I ran with the speed of light. After we were done playing, I saw him sliding a piece of paper from that little opening. He then looked at me, grinned, and waved goodbye. I grabbed the paper and opened it. He had written his phone number and asked me to call him sharp at two in the afternoon, and that he knew my parents would be asleep by that time. It was also written that if I don't do it, my friends' lives would be in danger. As an eight-year-old, didn't know any better, so I called him through my mom's phone. He picked up the call, and I didn't have the courage to say anything, so I was silent. He said, You're a good girl, just like me. You should come stay with me. Come outside. I'm waiting to pick you up. Because I lived upstairs, I went to the balcony, and he was actually standing near the gate, looking directly at me, waving and smiling. 
I couldn't contain it anymore, so I started crying and disconnected the call. I ran inside, bawled my eyes out in my room. Thankfully, my mother didn't wake up, and I cried it all out. I didn't go out for the next few weeks, and everybody kept asking me about it. I still didn't tell them, though. That guy stopped coming, too. I don't remember the time he stopped coming, but he did, and I was relieved. Eventually, this experience started fading, and I grew up. Fast forward to 10 years. I was 18, and my mother asked me to buy some snacks. I took my sister and went out. The shop I had to go to was at the end of the road, several houses away, so not too far. I was standing in a queue when I felt uncomfortable because of the man standing behind me, because he kept pushing me. Annoyed, I looked at him, only to realize it was the same man. My face went pale, and I could feel my heart throbbing in my throat. I tried not to panic and calm myself down by telling myself that he couldn't do anything in public. There were tons of people there, and that gave me a sense of security. As soon as my order came, I took out my wallet, hastily to pay, but he beat me to it. The owner looked at him weirdly, and then at me, because I was a regular there, and he was seeing this man for the first time. I paid for it anyway, and the owner politely asked him to take his money back. I gave the bag to my sister and asked her to go home and to inform our mom about a man following us. Just in case he attacks, I'll have a backing and she would be safe too. Our house is within the vision range of the shop, so I waited for her to get inside. And now it was my turn to go home. As soon as I stepped out, the man followed me and said something like, you're a beautiful whitey now. Let's catch up. Again, rough translation. I kept walking and walking, but now that we were far from the shop, he started speed walking, and I had to walk faster. I could feel goosebumps all over my body. I started running, and I could see him catching up to my speed when the owner called for him loudly, saying that some of his money was still on the counter and asking him to come back, which gave me enough time to get inside and lock the gate. I haven't seen him since that day, and it's been two years. I'm 20 right now, and I hope I never meet him anywhere in the future. I hope I never see him again, and I don't know why it has instilled a paranoia in me, and I dread seeing him when I turn 28. Here's a quick edit. I'm sorry, but I had forgotten at the time I wrote this. I told my mom everything after that because my dad lives in another city for work. I didn't tell him since it would make him hella worried and possibly affect his work. My distant uncle is a local cop. He's quite close and trustworthy. We tried finding the creepy guy after that, but couldn't. He literally vanished into thin air. We also asked the shop owner about him, and he said the guy came back, took his money, and left. Nobody else paid enough attention to him, so we couldn't find anything. I go to college by public transport, so I have to walk around one kilometer to reach the stop. I take the other road, which is opposite to the road that leads to the shop. It takes longer comparatively, but I feel better at least. Not once have I seen that guy or felt anything creepy since then, which is a relief. But again, I'm kind of paranoid every time I step out, though I do carry pepper spray and a sharp keychain with me at all time. About moving out, we cannot afford that just yet. Possibly after I complete my degree, which still has three years left, Disclaimer, 
Always report incidents like this to trusted adults and authorities immediately. Please do not handle similar situations the way that I did. It began the summer before I entered high school, 2018, with innocent messages on Facebook. I never understood why he continued to message me. After a couple of days of him texting six to seven times in a row, without reply, he stated that he was 26 from my hometown, but stationed elsewhere in the army and had plans to find a young wife to cherish. I made it clear that I was 14 years old and uninterested, then blocked his account. The next day, he made another account, calling me baby girl and telling me that I was what he wanted in a wife. This wasn't the first time I had dealt with an older man interested in me. I muted the chat and moved on with my life. I stopped thinking about him, enjoyed my summer, and then started high school. Everything was going great. Until the packages started to arrive. First, a necklace with his name on it. Then one shaped like a heart. They had receipts and were expensive. I was terrified that he had found my address, so I showed my mom everything. My mom tried to return the gifts. Not sure why that was her reaction. But he refused. Showing my mom the messages was the first time I had actually read any of them. They were weird, and some were about eloping with me when I turned 16. My mom found out that he went to high school with both of my older siblings. My sister recalled him as a weird anime nerd, and he was friendly towards my brother, also an anime nerd. I ended up blocking a few more accounts and tried to ignore what I thought wasn't that serious of a situation. After this, we never spoke of him again. One afternoon in November of my freshman year, I was in gym class with friends when I received a call with no ID. My friends told me to pick it up, thinking it was a telemarketer or spam that we could mess with. We all heard something along the lines of, I'm waiting outside of gym for when you get done with class. We thought it was another friend pranking us, laughed, and moved on. After class, I had a weird gut feeling, and tried to lead through the visitor's doors, but the coach told me it wasn't permitted. I walked out, and there he was. He grabbed my throat, jammed his mouth against mine, and told me he was disappointed. I wasn't wearing the jewelry he got me. Then he walked away. I sprinted to my theater teacher, the only teacher I trusted, and cried for the rest of the day until convincing my brother to pick me up. I blamed the tears on the recent passing of my grandpa. I kept receiving CDs, mixtapes, he wrote many songs about me, bracelets and cards until COVID began, but never saw him in person again after that day. So, to the pedophile that would not leave me alone, I hope I never meet you again and that you are rotting in a prison cell. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true creepy encounters. I don't know about you, but some of those gave me goosebumps. Before I move on any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes, along with the gifted members. Patty's niece, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Chris Elias, Denise S., Tina Mead, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, Sugar Spite, Mrs. Innerscare, and Anita V. Thank you all so much for remaining the supportive pillars for this channel. I can't thank you or say it enough, and I wish I can give every one of you a hug. <laughs> And our gifted members, The Conspiracy Archives, Grimm's Library, Adam Gregg, Nat Davies, and The Cryptid Sleeps. 
Thank you all and the other subscribers and listeners for supporting Back to Ashes. It means the world to me and the channel, because without you, I would not have a voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.